yet. Okay, awesome. So we should uh, start. Okay, so about the subsequent measurement and derecognition. Okay, so um, basically, basically, um, there are all the cost goes to the inventory costing systems. They ended up with only two possible location, right? First. First, this inventory is derecognized by being expensed, right? So that's the general entry you use, debit the cost of goods sold, credit the inventory, right? When you credit the inventory, that's the derecognized, right? You derecognize the inventory. So, uh, and then the expenses goes to the cost of goods sold. Or the inventory is not sold, so that remains in the ending inventory, okay? Um, so then the, uh, inventory uh, cost flow equation, beginning plus purchase, okay? And that's the total cost goods available for sale. And that equals the amount of derecognition versus whatever left in the ending inventory. So uh, the different methods, right? The first method is called the uh, specific identification. Uh, in 2100, I remember uh, we learned about this, right? For the low volume and high value items, right? If you are having an antique car, right? Having uh, some uh, famous paintings by the famous artist, right? Um, so then basically you just, uh, you know, tag each item with the cost, right? When you sell it, that's how much cost, um, cost goods sold, right? So, um, because it's not like you have, uh, like Walmart, right? You have uh, millions of items like this low value, right? You cannot, you know, make each item unique, right? But in this scenario, uh, this is, we are talking about the business that each of their inventory items is quite unique, okay? So you can just tag attached with their costing, right? For each item. Whenever this item is sold, and that, that costing is derecognized, right? Become cost goods, cost goods sold. Okay, um, this is the specific identification. Uh, cost flow assumptions, cost flow assumptions. Um, so in 2100, we learned about it, uh, these assumptions. So the whole idea is we need to allocate cost of goods available for sales into two parts. Cost of goods sold, those inventories derecognized, right? Ended up in the income statement, cost of goods sold, versus those ones are still on the balance sheet, right? The ending inventories. So how are you gonna do this allocation? So we need some cost flow assumptions, right? So we have FIFO, LIFO, weighted average, right? Uh, we, in 2100, we talked about the FIFO and the weighted average. LIFO is used in US. This is not acceptable in Canada for financial statement purpose or tax purpose, okay? So let's, we, we, we are not gonna talk about the LIFO. When I was a student, I had to know how to do LIFO, okay? When I was a student, uh, I need to know all this. But right now it's good because you don't have to do, you, have, you don't have to know about LIFO. Okay, you just need to know FIFO and the weighted average. Um, you know this really well. I mean, at least I know, I, I taught 2100, like we spent a lot of time, right, on this uh, FIFO and LIFO. You do a comparison, right, and uh, to calculate what's the cost of goods sold versus inventory under both uh, assumptions, and then you know that the total of cost goods sold plus any inventory is always equal uh, and the two different assumptions, right? Um, so yeah, I, I just think you know this. I, do you, you know this really well, right? FIFO and the weighted average, do you? Yes? Yeah. Okay, yeah. good, very good, awesome. Uh, so then uh, basically you can see LIFO that's not accepted for Canadian tax reporting or financial reporting. So let's just ignore LIFO, okay? So for when we compare FIFO versus weighted average, okay? So 
remember we talked about, you know, you can't get both. There's a trade-off between balance sheet items and balance sheet items and the income statement items, right? So you cannot hope to get both statement accurate at the same time. It's a trade-off. So when you do FIFO, when you are using FIFO, okay, so you are saying first in, first out, right? The items first in and then first out. This is a good approximation for the flows in accurately for most of the industries, right? For the majority of industries, they sell the items that was first in the inventory in the warehouse, right? So this is a good approximation for most of the industries, right? So therefore, therefore, the costing for the ending inventory is more accurate, FIFO. Okay? Because you are saying whatever left is the most recent items, right? Whatever left in my inventory, in the ending inventory, is the most recent items, right? That's kind of true for most of the industries, right? So then your inventory level using uh, FIFO is more accurate. So your inventory reported on balance sheet is more accurate, okay? So that's therefore we say it's a high quality, okay, of balance sheet for evaluation, okay? Because, because the, the inventory, ending inventory costing is more accurate. So the quality is high. Uh, and then because it's high for balance sheet, it's gonna be low for the income statement. So the cost of, cost of goods sold um, calculation is less um, accurate. Uh, so weighted average is medium, right? Weighted average is medium because LIFO is the opposite, okay? LIFO is the opposite. And the weighted, weighted average is the medium, okay? So uh, neither the income statement of, nor the uh, balance sheet items has a high quality of the evaluation, okay? It's a trade-off. Okay, it's a trade-off. Um, okay, so that's kind of the key difference between FIFO and the weighted average. Okay, this is the accounting policy the company has to adopt. Okay. Okay, so estimate cost of ending inventory, estimate of cost of goods sold. We talked about it's very expensive to do an inventory count, right? You, you shut down the door, right and then you ask all the employees to start counting items right it's quite time consuming so then you know just for decision making how can we estimate cost of ending in ending inventory okay how much is worth of the ending inventory at the year end right without me physically counting can i do a rough estimation so here's the method it's called the retail inventory method this is a method to help you to estimate the cost of ending inventory, okay? So basically, you apply an average sales margin to the retail price of the product, okay? To the retail price of product. So let's say you have 100 units, um, item A, the retailing price is $10, okay? Retailing price is $10. And then, what is your sales margin? Suppose your sales margin is 35%, okay? If your sales margin is 35%, what's the cost? Sixty-five percent right? If your sales margin is 35%, your cost will be 65% of the selling price, right? If you sell it for $10, your cost will be $6.5 per unit, right? And you have 100 units. 100 units times 6.5, right? 650. See, that's how you estimate it. That's how you estimate it, right? You know a sales margin and you know uh, the quantities, the quantities. And so then that's how you estimate uh, the cost of ending inventories. So you don't have to follow uh, FIFO, right? 
you don't have to follow weighted average. You, you have done that. It's uh, quite painful, right, to do all these calculations, especially for the moving average, right? Every time you have a purchase, you have to calculate what is the average, right? Every time, remember that? And you have to keep updating what's the inventory costing, right? Um, so it's quite a pain, right? So instead of going through those painful process, now you have this way to estimate the inventory costing for the management decision-making purpose, right? Okay, so basically uh, you know uh, what's the quantity and uh, if you have an accurate uh, average profit margin, okay? So then you can just estimate the uh, and the inventory. So the whole idea is using this cost um, flow assumption, going through those, sometimes quite complicated, right? Maybe there are some shortcuts, right? You know, you don't need a for the For the managers, sometimes they just want to know a rough number, right? It's not like financial reporting. They have to follow efforts, right? They have to follow all these different cost flow assumptions. For their decision making purpose, they just want to know a rough number. Um, a similar idea, right? Similar idea. Instead of using the uh, inventory equation, cost flow e equation, to calculate the cost of goods sold, can I just estimate the cost of goods sold, right? So we are talking about gross margin, gross margin method. Okay. So basically, you apply an average gross margin to the amount of sales. Okay. If you know for this year the sales is one million and the average of the gross margin is 20%, so your cost would be 80%, okay? 80% 80 of 1 million, that will be 800,000, see? You can just have this rough estimate, right? Um, so it's much quicker, much easier than going through those uh, calculations. So they are used for in interim reporting to save the cost, right? When you hire CPAs to do these calculations, it costs a lot of money. But anyone can do this cost, right? You don't have to be a CPA to do this estimation. Uh, not normally accepted for annual financial statement. So you, you can report this number in the annual financial statements, right? You have to follow the cost flow assumptions using FIFO or weighted average, right? And then figure out what's your cost of the sold. Okay, does this make sense? Very good. Um, you know, we always use, we, we say, well, well, we'll do a physical inventory count to figure out what's my annual inventory. And then I work backwards, figure out what's my cost of goods sold, right? Let me ask you a question, okay? What about, um, you know, the last month, uh, at the end of November, year end is December 31st, at the end of November, your warehouse caught on fire, okay? It burned everything to ashes. Okay, you lost the, all the inventory. And you are using periodical system. So you cannot do an inventory count, right? And, but you have to claim for the insurance, right? The insurance company is gonna pay for your inventory. My question is for you is, what is your ending inventory, <laughs> right? What is your, the cost of ending inventory? Zero, I guess. Zero, but you need to figure out a number because you need a number to tell the insurance company so that they can pay you, right? Uh, sorry, uh, I, think, I think. I'm sorry. Go, on. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I, I was going to say I think they would uh, basically uh, use historical uh, data uh, from previous years and what the sales were, and then based on that, they would forecast and say this would be our. This is. Like if it's a seasonal business, for example, and like, okay, we expect to get a million dollars every year or something. Yeah. And then if you're, everything burned down, then it'd be a million dollars. We expected sales of, yeah. and our inventory was set up for that, so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say as well. Just even you could go further and maybe, and you could do by monthly, you could figure out what you're doing for the year, averagely yeah. so far. Very good. Yeah, so exactly. So you know the, the ending inventory uh, as, a, so basically you know the sales, right? You can project the sales, and then you can estimate what's the cost of the sold 
for the, uh, the last months, right? And then you can work backward to figure out what's my ending inventory should be, right? So, you know, you can't do a physical inventory count, right? Everything, everything is branded. But at least you have uh, alternative ways to estimate it, right? And then you show the number to the insurance company, they will be able to reimburse you for the cost, right? Yeah. It has to, what if you has had to be no, reasonable. Sorry, what if you had no historical data? Uh, like, yeah, so basically if you, let's say uh, this is the first year, right? Yeah. Um, so then you you probably has to uh, you know um, you probably have Assume. to uh, based on maybe an average of the first eleven months in terms of your sales right mm -hmm. and then if you think November uh, December is actually uh, you know uh, it, but if you think that uh, um, you you have to kind of propose to the uh, insurance company about why you think this is a number, right? And it has to be reasonable, right? The insurance company will evaluate on that. So if, you, if your business is quite uh, steady, it's quite even throughout the year, so then you can kind of use the first 11 months of sales to project for the whole year's sales, right? Sorry, could I also just add? And like, you can you use could... an industry average. Sometimes you right. say, well, this is my first year's um, you know, I don't know what's the uh, average gross margin profit. Mm -hmm. and then you say, oh, guess what? This is the, the industry average, right? Things like that. Yeah. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah. No, sorry. Uh, you, you said it industry oh, average. I'm sorry. That's what I was going to. No, no, it's all I, good. You said I it. I worked out your answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, but can you use your, like, your sales records to determine the amount, uh, the number of items you sold? Yeah, if you are using a perpetual inventory system, then it's easy, right? So you know, you, you can, ask to, suppose there's no shrinkage, you know how many inventory left, right? In your accounting record, right? Um, but if it's a periodical uh, inventory system, uh, you don't know, right? But you just have to estimate. So does it mean that uh, under the periodic uh, system, the business or the company we have no record of sales or like it's confusing to me right now like does it mean there is no record of sales that they can use or is um, it because use periodic so they cannot use yeah the so you know they they probably have to use the uh, gross profit margin from an, if this is their first year they probably have to use the industry gross profit margin because they don't have their own number right the uh, this is their first year, it's not even the full year yet. Um, they haven't do the inventory count yet. So then the question is, you know, they know what is the beginning balance is zero because this is the first year and they know how many they purchased, right? Uh, and they don't know, the, they, don't know um, they don't know the uh, cost of goods sold, right? They don't know cost of goods sold, but they know the sales so far, right? They know how many sales so far, so then they can use uh, a gross profit, like maybe it's the uh, industry average times the actual sales up to this point. So then they figured out the cost of goods sold. So the purchase minus cost of goods sold, that's the cost of the inventory. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Yeah, so basically you know how, because you know the sales number, right? Whenever you have a sales, you credit the sales revenue, you debit AR, right? That's your general entry. Right? Up to this point, your account record has a sales number. Uh, and then you use a, a industry gross profit, right? So you your sales times gross profit, right? Uh, the the one hundred percent minus gross profit, that's the proportion of the, the, the cost, right? So use that proportion times your sales, that should be your cost of goods sold. And then your total purchase minus your cost of goods sold, that's your ending inventory. That's your estimation, right? I don't mean to make this too complicated. I was just using this as an example to show you um, it is very important, right? You, you need to know how to estimate, right? 
um, why we talk about estimation, right? It, there could be some uh, uh, scenarios that can be very useful. Um, so basically, if you, if you have the sales number, like you use like the budgeted cost of goods sold? Uh, your budget. So you mean like you probably think a certain percentage of gross profit to achieve, right? Yeah. And then how do you know that number? It's probably from the industry average, right? If, it's, if, you, are in new, if you are in a new business, um, you have a budget gross profit, then that budget number must come from the industry average. Ah, uh, okay. Does that make sense? Because otherwise, how do you, how do you know which, what budget number you use? Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have no previous experience. So you, have, you can only tap into your competitors on industry average. Yeah. So you guys are really interested in the warehouse caught on fire. <laughs> okay, can I move on? Yes. Oops. Okay. Um, so under FIFO, if you use FIFO method, so uh, your cost goods sold calculation and anti inventory um, calculation, the number will not be affected uh, by the type of system. Okay. In 2100, I, there was one question. Um, I have shown students about this. Okay. Uh, so the periodical or perpetual system does affect the amount under weighted average method. So if you are using weighted average method, your calculation will be affected by the type of system, right? And in fact, in fact, they have a specific term for the uh, perpetual weighted average cost method. They use the, the term moving average method. So moving av average method is for perpetual weighted average costing, okay? So this will be a distinguishment from the uh, periodical weighted average method, okay? Uh, yeah, so if you have time, try it, okay? You will see. Just the easier way to make sense of this is just like find the problem in the, in the textbook and try it, you will see the differences, okay? Subsequent measurement, okay? IFRS does not want us to overstate the inventory, okay? Inflation, uh, inflation of asset is always, uh, something the auditor wants to keep eye on, right? You, we don't want you to over-report, exaggerate your position, right? So the, the, the idea is over-valuation of the inventory. Um, there is a, uh, a mean, there is a market, okay, in North Lesbridge. Um, so they sell some kind of Asian product, right, spices. So, you know, so I went there, I bought something. <laughs> But it turned out it was expired, okay? And I was quite uh, mad, like it's expired for a long time. How can you still sell it, right? How can you still sell it? And um, so sure, you know, first time I'm a dumb person, <laughs> I, I should be more careful. I never went to that market again, okay? He can only trick me one time. <laughs> um, so that's the problem, right? For the inventory items, right? You know, if they are slow moving, if they are became obsolete, you have to consider how much you can sell these items. What's, what's the value of these items, right? So, you know, you think about the computer that was a cutting edge three years ago. You pay $2,000 for that three years ago. And nowadays, it, I think it's, where, it's probably only worth maybe, maybe under $1,000, right? If you carry any items like that, you should not carry, carry it at $2,000, right? You have to write it all, write it down. So when I was an auditor, uh, when I was walking in that warehouse, sometimes I would run my finger across the surface, right? And I want to see how many dust accumulated, okay? 
So if you have items sitting on the shelves for a long time, it's going to accumulate in dust, dust right? <laughs> and then you're going to ask them, OK, this is a slow moving item, OK? What is your evaluation? What's your evaluation on this item? And you know, sometimes they have these iron items, right? And they become like, they become like a, a rusted, right? <laughs> You'll be like, wow, this is for sure has been here for a long time without being sold. Can you still sell it? Right? If you can sell it, how much do you think you can sell it for? Right? So those are the valuation on the inventory, right? Uh, so the idea is uh, inventory has to be recorded at the lower of cost in the market, LOCM, lower of cost in the market, okay? That computer costs you $2,000 to buy, right? And now in the market, because this is three years later, there are much better technology, better computers. So you can't sell it for the price you want it, right? So you can only sell it for $1,000, even though it costs you 2000 But now you can only sell it for 1000 So you have to record this inventory at 1000 which is the lower of the cost and the market, right? The cost is 2000 market is 1000 The lower of the two numbers is 1000 You have to go with the lower number. That's the valuation for inventory. Okay? Um, so, if the market price is lower than the cost, you have to use the market price, okay? And then you, can, you have to recognize the loss, right? You have to recognize the loss. You debit the cost of goods sold, okay? Credit the inventory to recognize the inventory adjustment, downward adjustment. Um, what if, what if, um, you know, the, uh, your market price is higher than the, than the cost. Should you adjust upward? No, no. Because we recognize bad news earlier, we delay good news until later. Right? That's kind of a prudence principle. In chapter four, we talked about long-term contract. Uh, long-term contract, remember when there is the onerous contract? We recognize the loss the entire amount of loss immediately, right? So we recognize the bad news earlier. If there's good news, we delay the good news, right? We delay the good news until later. So remember, when you make a, a inventory adjustment, you only adjust it downward, okay? You, you never adjust it upward, okay? Any questions on this? Okay, I will move on. So, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so when you say delay good news till later, do you mean like you'd recognize it after the sale? Yeah, exactly. You can sell it for 10,000 now. Good, right? When you sell it, then you recognize the, the profit, right? Okay. Because you're gonna, you're gonna dive your cash, 10,000 credit sales, right? So, and then- yeah. Yes, at that time, you recognize the profit, right? You just have to be a little bit more conservative, right? You know, the good news is about, oh yeah, you can sell it for a good price, but you haven't sold it yet, right? Let's realize that good news when the transactions actually happen. Yeah, when it's guaranteed. Yes, exactly, yeah. But if it's bad news, you want to get this information across the users immediately, right? Okay. Yeah. Is that how we function as a human being sometimes? You know, uh, when you know something good is gonna happen, right? Uh, sometimes you think, oh, I just wanna delay, make sure there's no, <laughs> make sure it's, it's really gonna happen, right? You know, if, if I tell you get A plus and you are really happy, you wanna share with your, with your uh, you know, <laughs> family, but then you say, oh, guess what? I'm gonna really wait until I see that mark on my transcript, right? Uh, <laughs> but if it's a bad news, you probably try to kind of, uh, you know, tell it earlier <laughs> to warn people, right? Just to be ready, right? <laughs> so 
don't surprise people when it actually happened. <laughs> is that true in our life? Yeah, because you yeah. Get all the bad you stuff. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So that's good. I, it's at least consistent with our human behaviors here. Um, I'm not teaching you something too crazy. Okay. Um, so, what do we mean by market, right? Market price. What do we mean by that? There are different perspectives on this. The input perspective. Input is like you know um, when you, how you get this inventory, right? So we call it a replacement cost, right? So you buy an item, you have it. The question is how much you're gonna pay if you need to replace it, okay? Uh, so recently I I moved. The moving companies um, damaged my item, okay? Uh, but I bought the insurance, okay? So they had to pay for my item. So they would ask me, okay, so what's the, uh, what's the cost when I bought it? So it's uh, kind of like a, uh, a play, kitchen, play kitchen for the kid. I bought it for 180 US dollars from uh, WeFair, okay? Um, and then they, are, then they, they asked me, what's, what's the replacement cost? What's, how much is it gonna cost you to buy it now? 320, okay? Just three years later, the price has gone up from 180 to 320. Right, so what's the replacement cost for that item? Three twenty. How much is going? How much is going to cost you to replace this item? Okay. Um, for insurance companies, they often use replacement cost to determine the premiums of your uh, your your home insurance. Okay. So I bought a house, cost me six hundred. Okay. But they were saying that you know. If they are going to replace my house, it's going to cost $1 million. So they charge me a home insurance premium based on the replacement cost, $1 million. Okay? Because, you know, construction materials um, is cost more money today, right? Compared to five years ago when the house was first built, right? Uh, so input perspective, okay? Think about the replacement cost. If my items is gone, how much it costs me to replace this item? Okay. Uh, the output perspective, the output perspective, is that uh, what, how much you can sell it for, right? So for my house, okay. So I, in the end, I sell it for um, six seventy. Okay, six seventy. So that's the. Uh, oh, that's that's the selling price, but I also pay twenty thousand dollars for the realtors, right? For the uh, sorry, for the realtor agent. So my net realizable value is six fifty, right? Because I sell it for like six seventy, and I pay twenty to the real estate agent. Uh, so then the net realizable value is six fifty. So your selling price minus the cost for sale, right? So the, the cost incurred uh, in order for this to be sold, right? So the net realized value. So you can see it's interesting. Originally it cost me 600. To replace it, it's gonna be $1 million. But the market value, the net realized value is only uh, 650,000, right? So just to understand there are different perspectives in terms of the market, okay? There are different perspectives in terms of the market. Can I give a good example of that working out? Thank you, Josh. Yeah. So I have a rental property and when I bought it, the replacement value for insurance was almost double. So naturally my insurance premium was a lot more and the house was pretty old. I was going to have to do some rentals. And uh, just this last year, I had some wind, wind damage on the corner of the house. And basically I ended up getting all of my siding and I still had enough money to replace the windows as well from the corner piece because they couldn't match it or anything. And they had to do, they said they had to do it to replacement value. Mm -hmm. So that was an example of a really old home. Um, the replacement value worked in my favor. Yeah. Whereas my, my home I live in, there's no way I'd want it to have double the value because it's brand new. Right. So yes. Yes. it's kind of an example of like why I would want, actually want to pay more on insurance compared to not. Yes. Yeah. 
Very good. Thank you for sharing. Okay, Anybody else? You. Any question? Okay, I'll move on. Okay, so I first and ISB emphasizes net realized value. That's the output perspective. Okay, so I, I first and ISB emphasize on the NRV, net realizable value. Okay, here something important uh, in chapter six quiz, there's one question about inventory right now because this is new. In 2100, you didn't learn this, right? So I think. Um, be ready for a question like this in the main, in the final exam, okay? Because this is something new, you just learn this. So raw materials written down only if finished product requires a write down, okay? So remember, you have different inventory inventories, right? You have raw material inventories, working in progress, and finished goods inventories, right? If, okay, the only if finished product requires written down, the raw materials can be considered written down, okay? Why? Do you, why do you think so? Finished product. So if you have a, you are building furniture, right? Wooden furniture. Um, so the, uh, the cost right now is 100 to uh, finish the product but the uh, net realized value is 80. So you have to write off 20, right? Because you write off this finished product, you have to consider the logs, the wood, right? Why do you think so? Well, you could, uh, Takara, you are trying to say something, but your microphone is mute. Oh no, I sorry, I accidentally clicked it on. Oh, that's okay, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's easier for me to tell you to memorize this, but I think you, try, you, you, should, you should not try to memorize things, try to make sense of it, why? So why the furniture is written down, right? Uh, you have to consider the log, the wood, the numbers to be written down. Accurately. Um, estimate the cost allocated, maybe? Oh, okay. So what's the cost component for the finished goods? I think you are on the right track. Like, what's the cost component for the finished goods? So like how you have the three different inventories, uh -huh. you should only record what's being used in the finished product so you actually know how much of the raw materials you use. Yes, you still need the same amount of uh, materials to build, a, to build a, the, the furniture, right? Um, yeah. Maybe because that's a time when you consider the raw material, materials are like completely used by recording the finished product. Okay, um, let me uh, ask you a question to think this way. Why do, you think, why do you think that furniture does not work as much as before in the market from the market perspective? So what mm -hmm. happened in the market, your furniture does not work that much? The process of raw materials changed over time. Very good, very good. So think about the cost component. Good job, yeah. Uh, the cost component is raw materials, labor, and overhead, right? Do you think labor will labor cost will go down? Do you think labor cost will go down? No. No, no. right? Because people keep asking for raise the minimum wage, right? So labor cost will not go down, right? And then you think about overhead, utility bills, right? All this stuff. <laughs> those those things are not going down. So then your best hypothesis is about maybe my raw materials price comes down. That's why it's cheaper to build a furniture and the market price of the furniture goes down, right? Does that make sense? So that's the time, you know, uh, it's almost inferred from the finished goods inventories. If they are going down, maybe the, maybe the first thing you wanna check is your raw materials. So therefore, 
you check your raw materials to see if you need to make adjustment on the raw materials. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, because laborers will not go down, right? Labor costs will not go down. It's getting more and more expensive, right? Okay, so um, basically if finished product need to be written down, the enterprise should also evaluate raw materials for impairment. So make sure you remember this for your final exam, right? Don't forget this. So you, you finish your finished goods uh, product, you write it down, then you're not down, right? You're not down yet. You have to consider the raw materials, okay? So I can tell you right now, just to help you with your stress, there, there's gonna be one question in the final exams. It's about inventory, and it's gonna be about inventory impairment, okay? Are you happy with that? Okay, so make sure you highlight this, okay? This is important. Um, so if the market value recovers in subsequent period, uh, enterprise can reverse the previous inventory write down and record again. Previously, you recognize a, a loss, right? You debit the cost of the sold, credit inventory. Uh, but if the market changed in the subsequent period, things comes back, you're gonna reverse that entry, right? So I'm going to show you one example. Oh, oh not yet, okay? Unit or evaluation. Uh, so um, the standard will guide us saying that uh, inventory should be written down to net realizable value item by item. However, however, sometimes it's important you group similar items together for evaluation. So the general principle is that you evaluate each items. You have different raw materials, A, B, C, D, right? Uh, you evaluate each items separately, right? But however, if those items are closely related, okay, if, if, you, if you make a bicycle, you have to use raw materials A, B, C, right? Then you have to make them as a group and to evaluate the group whether there's a write down, okay? So I'm gonna show you one example, okay? Then you're gonna, hopefully it makes sense to you and uh, you have to make sure you understand this, okay? Here is one example. Um, a particular production process requires two types of raw materials to produce the end product. Each unit of finished um, product requires, uh, okay, three units of raw materials A, and the two units of raw materials B. The processing cost is $40. The following provide information on inventory at year end. 